3, verses 1 through 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, see how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. In our study of the book of James three weeks ago, we transitioned to from the, the trials and the, the fact that God is the giver of every good, uh, morally good, and every perfect bestowment, to looking at how James now would apply that, and that if we really believe that, if we really believe that God is the giver of every morally good gift and every perfect gift, then we will desire then to be doers of his word and not hearers only. That if, if we know that, that that is true, then we'll want to do what God has declared to do. And then in that, um, J- James states twice this concept of the potential of being deceived or even deceiving ourselves in that whole concept. And so if you're not reading his word and then not applying it, you're either being duped by Satan or ultimately you're duping your yourself. And so you're deceiving yourself. And so the idea there then is not being a hearer only, but a doer of the word. And we're told that the one who is a doer of the word um, is going to look into the perfect law of liberty. And so he equates then the word with the perfect law of liberty. And we know that the perfect law of liberty, as Jesus declared it, is that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so that the wholeness of God's word, as Jesus said, is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, and upon these all the law and the prophets are hanged. Or hanged, anyways, hinged. they, they, They come upon this. They're founded upon it. And so as we then looked at James, we saw that James then began to transition this into practical theology. How does this look as we play it out in our life? Okay, so the application of the perfect law. And we saw, first of all, in James chapter 2, that we are to be loving, loving one another, loving others without partiality, without hypocrisy. That if we're really following the the truth, the perfect law of, of Christ, Christ doesn't love with partiality. He loves everyone the same. He died for the sinners, of which we're thankful, right? And so if we are his followers, and if we're being doers of the word, not hearers only, then we will want to love others without partiality, without hypocrisy, without prejudging them, without prejudice. Secondly, last week, we looked at the concept of faith versus works. And again, as Chuck mentioned, um, that this is the area in which James uh, potentially um, well, actually, Chuck didn't mention this part, but James, again, as we talked about this, was potentially not canonized, wasn't part of the scriptures. And it's really that portion, at the end of chapter 2, that becomes the, the, the link as far as why they don't want to do that, because it says that can faith save a man on its own? And so we know that 
faith does save you on your own. But what James was bringing out, and that is that you can say you have faith, you can say that you believe, and remember the word pistis and pistuo literally is the word faith, but it also can be translated as believe. And so a lot of times we think of the word believe. And so there are people who say they believe, they say they have faith, but their belief, their faith isn't true, or it's not in the true God. How do you know when someone has a true faith? It's going to be borne out in true works, okay? Faith without works is, is dead. And so, again, if you really believe that God is the giver of every morally good and every perfect bestowment, then you're going to want to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. And if you're a doer of the word, that means you're going to be working. Does that make sense? That means it's going to be coming out in your life. And so it's not going to be just faith alone. It's going to be faith, as we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, that by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But then we're told that we are, what? His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which we should walk in them. So, so that we should do that. Now, we come into this third one. And that is the importance of words. Because again, if my faith is being borne out in my works, and I'm not loving par partially or hypocritically, then the reality is that what I believe as a whole is going to be revealed primarily in my, my words, in what I say. What is in your heart, and we'll come back to this in a, it, later at the end of the message, right? Because Jesus declares this, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you believe, what you really hold to, is going to come out of your mouth. The importance of words. Now, I don't have time to get into this part of it, so just understand, again, remember I said this is a, a Jewish guy writing to a Jewish audience, okay? The, the Jewish mind has a whole lot to say about the importance of your words. Life is in words, okay? Words hold the power of life and death. You can read through Proverbs, and we'll, we'll look at some of them, but you have a lot of verses on your sermon note sheet that I'm not going to go to today. But the, the words have the power of life and death. So sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never what? Hurt me. Is that true? It's a lie. It's, it's a total lie, because words kill. And so one of the things, when Jesus says, you know, um, you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I say unto you, if you call your brother Racha, empty-headed or an idiot, you're in danger of the, the hellfire. Hellfire, literally, is, is, is the, not just the judgment, but the hellfire. And so with over the kids at the Good News Club, one of the things I share with them is again, you've heard me share this in the past, you know, that can you see me, you know, and so most everybody here should say what? N no, no, you don't see me. Come on, see, no, you're, you're going to go through this again. You're going to cut off my arms, cut off my legs. You know, you, I'm still me. You cut off my arms, you cut off my legs, you burn me in a fire. I'm still me. I live inside this tent. And so when you attack me with a sword, when you attack me with a gun, you're attacking my tent. But when you attack me with words, you're attacking my inner person. Do you get it? You know, so sometimes we think, oh, you know, you get, it's like water off a duck's back. We get it. But it's not water off a duck's back. We have to train ourselves to try to get that way. But literally, honestly, it's not water off a duck's back. Words sink deep, okay? So the importance of words, and that's what James is going to get into here. Um, he's going to look at three, area, three ways that our words are important. And the first one he's going to talk about is how it's revealed in, in this exhortation to teachers. Okay, and so he begins in verse 1. He says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Well, that's the admonition. Now, note it says, let not many, not, let not many, okay, and I, hand, I have the M in red. Why? Because it's important. Because if it said, let not what? Any become teachers, okay? And so some would state that, that we should not set up teachers at all. But I remember when... Um, Queen Elizabeth, I think it was, who made a statement regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where it talks about those who were chosen by God. He's, she's so grateful, it says, not many noble. It doesn't say not any noble, but because she had the, the, the relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? And so 
this is not many, not, not any. And so people will go then to Jesus' statement in Matthew 23, okay, because of this whole statement. Jesus states in the New King James, but, but you do not be called rabbi, rabboni, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven, and do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And so, based upon that, we shouldn't call anybody our what? Our teacher. However, this is not the word didaskalos. The daskalos is the Greek word for teacher. This actually is the word down here, okay? So you can see it. I, I brought it into the, the um, transliteration of it for, for everybody. But kathegates, okay? One who is leading. So ago is to lead, and kata is according to, according to the leading of. And so anyways, it's one who is leading one who is directing. And this is the only place this word is actually used in the New Testament, three times, and it's all right here in this passage, okay? So this isn't the word. What, um, what Jesus is actually saying is that no one should seek to have a following after themselves. Do you get it? That's huge. No one should seek, I don't want you to be Bobites. A scary moment for me was many, many years ago um, I used to meet with two guys. I can tell you who they were. I can still picture the whole thing. We met at Burger King. Um, previous church, we had accountability groups, and I met at Burger King. And this is the day of Palm Pilots. Okay, so it tells you how far back. Some of you are like, what? Palm what? Anyways, so go look it up on Google. It'll probably show you a picture of a Palm Pilot. Anyways, um, but in days of Palm Pilot, and the one guy pulled out his Palm Pilot and began to read a bunch of Bobisms. I'd make a statement or whatever in a, in a message, and he would write it down. And I thought to myself, you know, Jesus says you will give an account for what? Every word has come out of your mouth. This guy is just doing a partial thing, right? I mean, they weren't bad things that I said. They were things that, that meant something to him, and he wrote them down, okay? So that was kind of cool, but not from my perspective. It was like, I don't want Bobites. I want you to follow Jesus. What he says is profound and will stand the test of time. My words are like the chaff which the wind drives away. And that's, we put on, um, on the website and stuff like that, we want anything that's stated of ourselves, we want it to be like the chaff which the wind drives away. But anything that's of God, we want it to stick. And so, so be careful. So what Jesus is saying here, we shouldn't be seeking to make followers of ourselves, is, is the idea, okay? He's not saying that we should, ought not to have teachers. Rather, there are multiple verses in the Bible, specifically Ephesians 4 and others, where it tells us that Jesus himself gave gifts to the churches, and some of those gifts that he gave to the churches included pastors and teachers, and he gave us pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. So the purpose of the teacher in the assembly, if you would, is to equip the church, to, to outfit the church, in order to do the work of ministry into the edifying of the body of Christ. That's my, my function. I have, so don't lot, don't, Please don't lift me. I mean, I, I know people like to call me um, pastor or whatever. But again, for the, for the adults, okay, and that's more for the kids from that perspective as far as a, um, a, a term like Mr. So-and-so or whatever. But for you adults, I'm Bob. There is no difference between me and you. The only thing that God has allowed me in this body, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to have the privilege of being a teacher, to being an equipper. That's it. I'm just a voice box from that perspective. Now, as we're going to see, I, I'm going to give a greater account for everything I say. But what I also want to point out through this is we are all, though, even though I am specifically in my role a teacher, the reality is every single one of you, every single one of you, just as you're supposed to be an evangelist. So I don't have the gift of evangelism, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, what do you call it? My words. Say it again. I'm not absolved from being an evangelist, right? I just don't have that gift, but I still need to go out and proclaim his news. And so you may say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching. I'm not a teacher. Yes, you are. Anytime you open your mouth up to somebody else and you tell them things that you know, you are an influencer. You are a teacher. And you need to understand that, okay? You have a sphere of influence. And by your words you will also be judged. 
What are you encouraging people toward? Are you encouraging them toward Christ? Or are you encouraging them to the world? Are you seeking to have people follow you? Or are you seeking to have people follow Christ? See, it's not just, we like to put that to the church realm. We like to put it to the YouTube preachers and to the, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is, it goes for every single one of us. If I want people to be a follower of Bob and not a follower of God, then I'm wrong. Okay? So, um, so the admonition, do not become many teachers, okay? But it's followed by the argument. Why? Because they will have a stricter judgment. Now, in the King James, I think it is, that says they will have a stricter condemnation, okay? And I want to bring this up because some of the versions will have the word condemnation, but it's not. The wording is important here. It's, it's the word crino, not the word catacrino, okay? And so crino is to judge or to assess. We might as well bring that up. To, to judge or assess or decide, okay? But catacrino, and I'll bring that one up so we can talk about it, is to mean to decide against. And so it is to choose against somebody. So in John 3, 16, let's, everybody turn there, okay? So John chapter 3. I want something to put in mine. We know the passage well, Okay. This is the word crino, though. John 3, beginning of verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge, to assess the world, but that the world through him might be, what? Saved. He, also, he who believes in him is not, what? Condemned or judged, assessed. But he who does not believe is assessed already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So you get it? So this word isn't catacrino. This is the word crino, okay? So there's a point where God's going to do what to your life? He's going to assess your life. Okay, so you go to Revelation chapter 20, okay? Revelation 20, chapter 20, you have the great, great white throne judgment, right? You have the throne, okay? The judgment seat of God, and the dead, small, and great are going to come before him. What's going to happen? The next thing. They're going to be what? They're going to be judged. They're not going to be condemned. They will be, but they're not condemned immediately. They are what? Judged. They are assessed based upon what? Their works, what were written in the book of works. And then there's going to be a singular book also that's there, and that's the Lamb's book of life. So after they are assessed according to their works, and they're found what? Wanting, right? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not an individual, based upon their works, is going to be allowed into heaven. So everyone, based upon their works, is going to be assessed to, to fail. Do you understand? Therefore, based upon the failure, there will be what? Condemnation, a judgment against them. But now we're going to look over at the Lamb's Book of Life, right? Is their name in there? Their name's not there. Uh oh, that's exactly right. The judgment, the judgment that is pronounced is now fulfilled. If your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there is no condemnation. Do you see it? Okay, do you understand it? So I'm going to skip 2 Corinthians 5 right now, but that talks about the, the judgment for us as well. But go to Matthew chapter 12, so we can see the difference here of this word for catacrino, Matthew 12. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and what? Condemn it. And it really is that word catacrino. They will rise up and they will have a judgment against. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater as Jonah is here, that in that day when the men of this generation stand before God, think of it like a jewelry box. The men of Nineveh, this is a really amazing an, an illustration if you think about it. The men of Nineveh are going to be sitting in that jewelry box. 
And they're going to say, well, based upon all this, based upon everything we've heard from the, the books of the works, um, what do you men of the jury say? And you got the men of the jury who are the people of Nineveh who heard the word of Jonah and they what? They repented. And what are they going to say? They're guilty. They're guilty. Even as pagan Gentiles, we understood when the Jewish prophet came to us and we repented. But here they are, your own people, who should know the truth and have rejected it. There is no other sacrifice for them. That's the word condemnation. But let's end it on a good note. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. We're going to start, it was just one to four, but we could end it um, with the end of chapter two. There is now, there, there is therefore now what? No catacrino. There is no judgment against. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see it? The difference between catacrino and crino. You are going to be assessed. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 3 talks about that. Your works are going to be assessed. And those things which are done with wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to be what? They're going to be burnt up. But those things which are just silver, gold, and precious stones, they will remain, right? And so, um, so Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5 about the, the man who was doing something that even the Gentiles wouldn't do. He was living with his father's wife, right? And he says, I'm handing him over to Satan that his, his flesh will be destroyed, but his soul will be saved. There is no judgment against those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you get it? Do we need to say it again? This is critical. You can't lose your salvation, assuming you have it. Again, faith without works is dead. So, if you are truly saved, that's between you and God, there is no judgment against you. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned, had a judgment against sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you are His, if you really are His, if you're walking in the Spirit and not in the lust of your flesh, if, if you're truly saved, there is no judgment that comes against you. Period. Okay? So, revealed an exhortation to teachers. Be not many masters. Be not many teachers, instructors. Why? Because they're going to have the greater assessment. I am to whom much is given... Much is required. I say this, and I mean it. I get it. I know that when I stand before God, I'm going to give an account for everything I've taught you and for everything I've taught anybody else. And now that all of our stuff is going out, I mean, it's on Spotify and, and Audible and Amazon and Pandora and iHeart and uh, iTunes and all the other eyes. Anyways, and so it's out there. I mean, we just, a couple of weeks ago, just a week before family camp, a lady from, from Australia emailed us. She got saved going through the series in Revelation. Isn't that kind of cool? Okay. So, but that, what that tells me is that what I already knew from Spotify, and that is that down in Australia, they're massively listening to the series in Revelation that we gave back in 2009. I'm going to give an account for all that teaching. My prayer videos on YouTube I'm going to give an account for all that teaching. The YouTube videos of our messages that go up, I'm going to give an account. David's going to give an account. Chuck's going to give an account. Steve's going to give an account. Because some of their videos are up there. Some of their audios are out there as well. Years ago, the previous church, when it divided, when it blew up, I, I say this. I, I, I get it. I, I don't, I'm not hiding from this. I stood judged before God. I was a shepherd that helped scatter sheep. I made bad decisions. I'm not hiding from that. 
People, oh, no, no, no. I, I'm not saying I'm the only one who made, a, made bad decisions or, or were wrong. But I'm not absolving myself of the decisions I made. And my loving Heavenly Father will chasten those whom he loves. I know I was put on the shelf for a period of time so I could learn. They laid hands on the novice. The novice got, ex got experience, but then he needed to learn more. And I'm okay with that. My, my God has a, a, a solid purpose for my life. But you will give an account in the same way, whether here on earth or when we get to heaven. So think about what you tell people. Think about the words you say. You can't take them back. There are things I'd love to take back that I've said to my kids. I can't take them back. There are things I'd love to take back that I said to my wife. I can't take them back. There are things I'd love to take back that I've said to people that I was supposed to be ministering to. And my flesh got a hold of me. And I spoke out of turn. I'd love to take it back. But I can't. You will give an account. The wording, the warning then as well. Ezekiel 3 and 33 talk about um, shepherds and um, watchmen of the, and that the fact is that you are, in a sense, like a watchman on a watchtower. If you see something coming in somebody's life and you do not tell them, you're going to give an account for that. But if you set yourself up as a shepherd of people and, and want to herd them and, and teach them and train them, you're also going to give an account for that as well. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 to 5 says, It is required in the stewards that one be found faithful. Verse 5 then goes on and says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. It's not just even then the words which I'm speaking to you right now, but God knows why I'm doing it. He knows my motivations. And he will judge me. He will assess me, even based upon why I did it. Someone came up to me years ago and said, talked about how humble I was. I know it doesn't seem very humble for me to share this with you. But my response was to them, just remember that even humility can be prideful. Even humility can be prideful. Because being humble, people love you. So you put on humility, right? It's cool. Because people think, wow, what a humble servant he is. And they lodge you up and your pride's getting bigger and bigger. God knows if you're doing it that, for that reason. He knows whether you're really serving others or whether you're really humble. And so I had this conversation with you know, someone recently about the humility and, and, and being servant. Look, I promise you, there are many, many times my heart is not to serve. I mean, I'm just like, Arr. but military, right, David? You play your, you play your part, you play your role, okay? I understood. I hated this. I hated this. And so I hated when they told me I had to go down to AIT to do something. For those of you guys who are there, AIT stands for Advanced Individual Training. And down in that area were nothing but privates and, and that kind of stuff. And if you walked down there, the privates saw that lieutenant coming, and they would separate. So that every, they only had to salute you once, but you had to walk down that road. And I hated playing, playing that game, but I knew my, my part. I knew my role. Be careful of playing a role and not having your heart change to be that role. A servant is a servant before he's a servant. A shepherd's a shepherd before he's a shepherd. A servant, deacon, is a servant before he's a servant. Do you get it? I love to teach. That comes from God. I, I know it's a, a, a spiritual gift from that perspective, and I don't mean that to be prideful, because that wasn't me. And so now I just love to teach. But I've got to be careful, because I love to teach. Does it make sense? And so I've got to be careful that it's not just Bob satisfying himself and getting excited about the, the teaching aspect of it. All right, so the warning. You're going to have a stricter judgment, a, sick, a stricter assessment. What's the advice? First of all, clearly there's a need then for humility. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 3 says, um, in the middle of it, says knowledge puff ups, but love what? Edifies. If anyone thinks 
that he has, knows anything. He knows nothing as yet he ought to know. The reality is that if you're going to be a teacher, and you all are, the first thing you need to work on is humility, humbleness, understanding that you are not the know-it-all. You may think you know it all, but you don't know it all. Yesterday during the men's breakfast, someone asked me about my thoughts with Israel and Iran, and I made a comment, and somebody else made a comment, and they had more information about it based upon it. And I went, wow, okay, cool. And so I didn't stand condemned from that perspective, but I stood, whoop, this is cool. More information, new information, firsthand information that I didn't have. And I went, okay, this is really kind of cool. And so you never know as much as you think you know. The more that you think you know, the more that you, you never know next to what God knows, we know next to nothing at all. Right? It's not mine, it's Ken Ham. Anyways, so I can't claim that one. Okay? It's a good one. 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 4, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments. Do you realize that this, the spirit of demonism is a spirit of division? Satan loves to divide. And so 2 Corinthians 11, we're not going to go there, but 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for someone may come in with another Jesus, another gospel, or another spirit, and you may very well accept them. And then he goes on to say that these are false workers, false apostles, that these are actually workers of Satan. And he says, this is no marvel, for Satan himself also portrays himself to be an angel of light. So therefore, it's no marvel if his, if his ministers also pretend to be, present themselves as ministers of righteousness. We've got to be careful. The need for humility, the need then for diligence. As a teacher, as the one giving instruction, to be diligent, to present yourself approved to God, not to man, but to God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing. So Matt, my oldest son, years ago, Awana, and they had a, you know, this is a Wanus key verse, right? So, uh, study. Is that how King James says study? Uh, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Lightly divining the word of God. Lightly divining the word of God. That's exactly what many people do. They, instead of rightly divide, they lightly divine. Okay, God, send me to the passage. Now, I know God, Jesus promised to give you the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. But I promise you, it's not the hunt and peck method. It's to study God's word. That's what he wants us to do. Remember that you continue in it, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one shall be blessed in his deed. That you are studying, that you are being diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the word of truth, shunning profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness and then these others who have done it who strayed concerning the truth. Look, that's the other thing that, that the YouTube and stuff like that, there's good things about YouTube, but there's bad things about YouTube. Again, we talk about Sunday school. The reality is any, every single one of you can have a channel and you can set yourself up as a, as a teacher, Okay. And the sad thing is that there's a whole lot of people out there doing that, and there's a whole lot of people following it, because there's a lot of people that are looking, having itching ears, seeking to themselves, setting themselves up, what? Teachers, okay? So I've got to be careful. I've got to be careful what I'm teaching, because again, I'm going to be counted for it. But the other side is that knowing that this is going to happen in the end times, okay, that there are going to be false teachers that are there, you all, as well, as well as myself, need to be diligent in knowing the truth. Again, that we're not following after a counterfeit. And I promise you, uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, I've had to deal with doctrinal deviance, uh, is that deviation so much more than I ever had to in the first 20 years of ministry. What's the difference? The internet. More people are going to the internet for, for, that, for that instruction, okay? When it was just books, people didn't write them. They couldn't get a publisher to write them. But now you don't have to have a publisher. You just have to have a camera, and you have to have a microphone, and you just need to upload it. So 
There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. The word heresy is literally the word division. They will seek to divide. They're going to seek to bring others after themselves. Remember what Jesus said about wanting a following? They're going to want a following. Isn't, well, I mean, think about it. What's YouTube based on? Followings. Following. You make money based upon your following. And so they, they monetize. We don't monetize. It frustrates me now that YouTube changed their policies back in 2021 that they can throw an ad in the front if they want to, even if you said you don't want to be monetized. We choose not to be monetized. Freely you receive, freely give. So if you ever get an ad in front of one of ours, complain to YouTube. Okay? Don't complain to me. Complain to YouTube because they've made a decision to do that even when we said we don't want it. Okay? It's their right. It's on their platform. You know, yada, yada, yada. But complain to them and tell them, hey, no, I know these people don't want to be making money off that. So don't do that. Okay? But they're going to come on with these divisions and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. By covetousness, money, power, prestige, do you get it? It's all out there, okay? It's amazing how much money people make off of YouTube. All right, we need to move on. So that's revealed in exhortation um, to, to teachers, revealed in examples from nature. So he goes on, and he says then, back here in, in James, if I can find it. I made a marker for myself. So James, he said, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a what? A perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. So here we got a bridle. This is that part that's going over the, the ears and over the head, and it comes down, right? And But the most important part of that bridle is what? The bit, okay, that it holds. And that's where James continues. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. So when you're riding on a horse, now, if you have a well-trained horse, you're not, and you're in war, Okay, you are not guiding that horse by its reins, by the bridle or by the bit. What are you what are you actually guiding the horse by? Your knees. Your knees. Yeah. So back in the day, back in the when they used the, the steeds and that kind of stuff, that tr that horse was trained. They they felt the the knee coming in and knee going out, and they were one with the rider. Okay? And so they would do that because they needed the, their hands to fight the battle, right? They can't worry about the horse. Okay, and so, but the reality is that for most horses, okay, that they will be then guided by that bit because the bit chafes the mouth, right? My prayer is, Lord, put a bit in my mouth. Too many times I go the way I choose to go and not the way the Lord is leading me to go. Lord, put a bit in my mouth that when I need to be yanked, I'll submit to the yanking. The horses, ships, these big, massive. Have you gone down and been in the water, down in the ocean, and have one of these big liners come past you, and you realize how small you are compared to one of these things? The rudder is so tiny compared to this massive ocean liner. And it says, look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Your tongue controls your destiny. Did you ever think about that? I always warn my boys, well, of two pieces of meat that can control your destiny. You track where I'm going. I won't go any further on that one. Okay? And you've got to be have self-control in both ends. You wag your tongue, someone's going to close your mouth. I grew up in the city. This is city talk. You open it up too much, you'll find someone's going to feed you. And you're not going to like the knuckle sandwich that you're going to get. It's going to happen. And so my prayer for my boys, I mean, you don't want you guys to get in, but... My prayer was at some point, if they got to opening up their mouth too much, that someone would teach them a lesson. You don't want that, but that's the reality, okay? That's a guy thing, okay? But your mouth is that way, okay? And it'll guide, and what you say will change the course of your destiny, okay? Because you can't what? You can't grab them back. That's one thing nice about text and email. That's bad because you can't put the emotions through there, okay? But you can always what? 
delete it before you send it. You know, it's one of the things in counseling to be able to write down what, how you really feel without saying it. Just write it down, and then what? Then burn it, throw it away, rip it up, you know, run it through the shredder so somebody doesn't, what, accidentally read it, okay? So you want to get rid of it. But write it down. If you're really feeling it, go ahead and write it down, get it out, and then do what you're supposed to do with it, and that is what? Get rid of it. Destroy it, because it, you don't want to share that, okay? Ships. Wildfires. This is exciting. This is an actual wildfire. Do you, you recognize it, David? Yeah, it looks like that one. Yeah, it's 2007, October 21st, 2007. So um, 16 years ago yesterday, this is called the Buckweed Fire. Um, it was in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles, okay? And it destroyed 65, um, 63, 65 um, uh, structures and over 35,000 acres of land were burnt. It was finally contained on November 1st, 2007. Does anybody know how it was started? Not a cigarette lighter, not a campfire. How about a 10-year-old boy playing with a single match? A 10-year-old boy playing with a single match. Now, I'm not condemning that kid because I remember being that little boy and I remember hearing the fire engines coming and us taking off. Okay, we didn't have a big one like that, but anyways, I, so I, don't, I, I can still remember being that little guy in the city. There's not a whole lot of woods in the city, but anyways, still, it was big enough that the fire department was coming, right? And so, that's your tongue. That's what your tongue can cause. That's what James is saying. He says, see how great a forest a little fire kindles. In the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by Gehenna, by hell. This isn't Sheol. This isn't Hades. This is actually Gehenna. It's actually hell is what he's talking about, the place of hell, the place of fire. Our mouths, our tongues can destroy. Wildlife. All forms of wildlife have been trained, have been domesticated. Lions. I wanted to have tigers, but I didn't have a tiger. I was going to say lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! Okay. But we don't have that. We have lions and bears and more lions. Mountain lions, pumas, cougars, whatever you want to talk about it. That's a seven foot tall bear. Yeah. Hmm, no, 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 no. I mean, did you ever just want to hug a bear? They look so soft. No, 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 no kind of cool. Like, man, I need to go out and get myself a Kodiak, you know? I mean, what, what kind of cool pet that would be? Every wild animal. That's what he's saying. Look, this, so this, is, this is 2,000 years ago, James is saying this. Isn't this kind of cool? He says, he says, you know, for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. So we, this isn't nothing new under the sun. James says, we're already doing this. We can tame all these different wild animals. But what? But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly what? Poison. The deadliness of the tongue. We can control the power and the influence of these great beasts. Bring them to use. I mean, think of oxen. You know, in the day, they didn't have the John Deere tractor, right? The, the, the fields were plowed by wild beasts that were domesticated. But the tongue, no man can control. It pours forth its poison all the time. Again, the Jewish mindset. Words bring life or words bring death. What do your words bring forth? Are you setting a fire? And destroying acres of land, if you would, acres of life? Or are you edifying, nurturing? Are you like the rain which comes and feeds the earth instead? Can you train a dog but not train your tongue? It's revealed then in the expressions of our mouth. I know this is a big statement here, a lot of 75-cent words, but 
it says what I wanted to say. The irreconcilability of a disparate mouth. With our tongue, we bless God, and with our tongue, we curse men. It can't happen. That's what he's saying. This doesn't make any sense at all. How does it play out? How does it play out that out of my, the same mouth, I can bless my God with one statement and then turn around and curse somebody who's made in the similitude of God with the next statement? Faith without words, works, words, is dead. Do you get it? Out of the abundance of our hearts, our mouths speak. So how does it play out? Oh, God, I praise you. You idiot, I can't believe you. Oh, God, I love you so much. You are such a... Have you ever had the experience coming out of your quiet time? Have a great quiet time. And then within 30 seconds, it's gone. And you're wondering, what just happened? Romans 7 just happened. Why do I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I do want to do? There's this war that's going on within me, right? So Galatians 5, as we talked about last week and we talked about in Sunday school today, is that the, the, the spirit lusts against the flesh and the, and the flesh against the spirit so that I cannot do the things that I wouldn't. And there's this battle that's going on within me. It's always, so I have to be vigilant. I have to be diligent to guard my mouth, to bridle my tongue. If you get nothing else, I hope it's just a, that you need to be praying to God to put a bit in your mouth. Maybe a sock. <laughs> it's too many times, it's really what I need. You know, we always joke about Peter, you know, being able to put, you know, he's big enough to put his foot in his mouth. Sometimes I think I can put both my feet in my mouth. And sometimes I think I should leave them there so I don't say anything again. These things ought not to be what? So, does it bother you? If it doesn't bother you, on this hand you bless God, and on this hand you curse men. If it doesn't bother you that you're doing that, you need to stop and do an assessment, a self-assessment on yourself. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but the second is like unto it. You love your neighbor as yourself. And you wouldn't want someone talking to you like you are talking to them. The illustrations then from nature. He take, goes right from this, this irreconcilability of a disparate tongue to, to the spring of water. He says, you go to this spring, and so this is an actual spring coming out of the rocks, right? And so it's in the, in the forest, and your first thing you want to do is to go up, and you want to cup your hands, and you want to do what? Take a drink out of it. Because when you ever you find a, a natural spring in, in, the, in, the, in the forest, generally it's sweet water. Unless something bad up river. Anyways, but it's from an aquifer, right? It's from the rain. The rain comes down. It sifts through the, the, the sand and through the, the dirt, and it's filtered out, and it comes down into an aquifer. And the aquifer runs underneath the ground to a certain point where it, it finally the water from below is, is, builds up to a point where it just... It has to come out of the ground someplace, and that's what a, a spring really is. That's what a, like an artesian well kind of concept is. It's just it's an aquifer that an aquifer is a, a, a like a little river of water that's underneath the, your um, your ground. Okay, if you don't know that. Anyways, we used to have one that came up in our garden many 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 years ago, that right in the middle of the cucumber patch. That year we had like hundreds of cucumbers, and you could just see it bubbling up. It was just that the exact spot. I guess we had tilled it or whatever, and it caused the, where the, the water came, and so it were stopped, and all of a sudden the water from below was so much that it would just start bobbling up. And so I remember <laughs> Marcia wanted to touch it, and I said, I wouldn't do that. She had new white tennis shoes. Needless to say, we live in Georgia. They weren't white tennis shoes afterwards. And um, she said, no, I want to touch it. Too late, you know. And momentum's going. You know, sunk down deep into that. Now she has orange tennis shoes. Anyways, back then she did anyway. And so... You want to touch it. You want it. It's all there. What, what would happen if you, you went under there and you scooped it up? And you go, oh, this is wonderful. And then you, you went and you, you filled up your canteen with it because you're going through the. And then as you took a drink from it later, it was what? Bitter. Salt water. There's no way. 
It can't happen that way. It's not like the, the spring was sweet, and then all of a sudden it turns what? Bitter and, and, and salty. It doesn't happen that way. That's what he's saying. Even nature. Nature tells you this ought not to be so. That from what the source is, it's con- there's got to be consistency in it. So the analogy of water, and the analogy then of fruticulture, right? What kind of tree is that? Can anybody see it? Good. Say it louder. Be, be confident, Tucker. Go ahead. It's a fig tree. No, you're not. I'm just joking. You are right. You are right. No, I'm joking. So, would you expect then, Tucker, to take door number one or door number two? The top or the bottom? The top, because they're figs. You wouldn't expect to get olives. And that's what James is saying. Look, when you got a fig tree, you expect to get figs. You don't expect to get olives. When you meet a follower of Christ, what do you expect to get? What should you expect to get? I don't know anymore. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance. It's like playing roulette. House wins. I got to check out the house first. So if I had one of those, that's a what? It's a grapevine. What would I expect to get? Well, neither one of those. I expect to get grapes. There's a reality, right? I know we're not talking about creation and evolution, but... This is my greatest illustration when I talk to people at their, at their door and they want to tell me that they're an atheist. I look for some, some tree, some fruit tree, some whatever that's around them and I ask them what it is and I ask them why. Anyways, because even an atheist proves that he believes in creation by design because he knows what he expects. He goes to a grapevine, he doesn't expect to get an olive. He doesn't expect to get a fig. He goes to a fig tree, he doesn't expect to get an olive. He expects to get a fig. Nature itself tells us that if I'm following Marx, Karl Marx, I'm going to be a what? Politically. A Marxist. Bring it into a better term for me. Probably socialist. In some more, some sense. Does that make sense? I mean, we just know that. Just, just even in any realm like that. If I'm a follower, then, of Jesus... My words ought to be consistent with that as well. (laughs) So, quickly, instructions from God's word. A tree is known by its fruit. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the treasure of his uh, good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. If evil things are coming out of your mouth, you make the analogy. Jesus said so. It's not me. It's not your wife, it's not your husband, it's not your kids who are accusing you, who are assessing you. It's you yourself. You will be condemned by your own words. Ephesians 4, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer one another. Desire to build people up and not tear them down. So in the end, oh, so we have Proverbs, you can read those. The tongue of the righteous choice silver, the lips of the righteous feed many. The tongue of the wise promotes health. How would God describe the spring of your mouth? How would God describe the spring of your mouth? Not how will you describe it, but how would God describe it? What comes from the abundance of your heart? Now, you may still be stumbling, But do that 10-year look. 10 years ago, was it worse than it is right now? If God is doing a work in you, and he who began a good work in you will continue to perform it to the day of Christ, then that's a good thing. I can honestly, I know I still struggle with my mouth sometimes, but I can go back 40 years ago. I am not the same guy. Okay? Even 30 years ago, I'm not the same guy. I mean, God is doing that work in my life. And so my prayer is that he continues that work. And that maybe by the time he finally takes me home, I'm, I'm there, you know, where I can bridle, you know, he's a perfect man, right? Because he can bridle his own tongue, you know, that I can finally get there. Okay? Are you changing? Are you setting fires or helping to quench them? Are you influencing and instructing others in the ways that are edificational or destructive? Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your words that are true that you have sent forth the word who became flesh 
and who dwelt among us. And that we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, help us to be mimickers of that word, that our mouth would be full of grace and truth, that we would be loving as you're loving, we would be generous and kind as you are generous and kind. We would speak truth in love, not seeking to put others down. Lord, help us as we influence other people, and we are, in a sense, teachers, the daskalos, um, in their lives. Lord, help us to, to point them and lead them and guide them and instruct them towards you, pointing them to the source of all truth, to the one who desires to redeem them and transform them. May you be exalted, Lord, in our lives and in our words. In Christ's name, amen.